I have ME, a severely debilitating chronic illness. I don't remember what it's like to not be in constant pain. I don't remember what it's like to sleep a full night. I don't remember what it's like to think without brain fog, to stand and not feel my knees trembling, to live without feeling like I'll faint. My earliest memory of this is when I was six. So to say the least, I am highly familiar with being sick. And that's not really a problem for me. My body does the things I need it to do. It's the world I live in which does it. If I attend school physically, I am deemed too well to be getting any accommodation. But if I am not at school, I am deemed too sick to get a proper education. My schools don't see that I need more assistance than they are providing because their expectation is that I should be happy barely passing high school. My accommodation is to the extent that I will pass, not to the extent where I have the opportunity to do as well as I would without my illness. When I was referred to my hospital's pain clinic, two male doctors had the fantastic idea of turning my medical appointment into a pep talk. I was told I am too skinny to be sick, too pretty to be sick, too young to be sick. They told me I was wasting the best years of my life. I needed to chill and get back to it. I was sent there to get pain management treatment and I left feeling as though it was my fault I'm sick. This amongst many other problems, is what makes anything and everything more difficult for me, not the existence of my illness. Schools, doctors, public services and friends contribute in constructing a role, role for the chronically ill. In this role, your only goal, your only ambition in life is to cure your illness. Until you're cured, you're expected to pause the rest of your life. But what happens if your illness isn't cured? We view illness as something temporary, something to be cured. Mine and millions of others' reality is that there is no certainty in getting well. Waiting for a time which very well may never come is beyond damaging to our well-being. And when any effort I make to get an education, to keep in touch with friends, to lead as normal of a life as possible, is met with barriers rooted in prejudice, the safest and perhaps only option becomes inertia. The only option becomes to succumb to the role of stillness, of pausing everything. Inertia in this context is both physical stillness and societal stillness. Nothing changes as no one is there to get the ball rolling. Inertia is the role assigned to chronically ill people. A role where stillness in all aspects of life, except for health, is required. For my illness specifically, and for many other chronic illnesses where the cause is yet to be discovered, the good girl syndrome is used to explain it. Now, having good girl syndrome means you caused your own illness due to the stress which you have put on yourself. Doctors will hold your good or even average grades against you. If you do sports, they'll say you pushed yourself too hard. Any achievement, any sign of stress will be used as your explanation. Following this explanation is that you are your own cure. You caused this and thus you must fix it. If the good girl syndrome can't be used to explain your illness, people will turn to the lazy person who exploits benefits. As opposed to the good girl syndrome, where your ambitions and goals are held against you. Your averageness is held against you. You are merely lazy. You want to be sick because all you want to do all day is lay in bed and watch TV. These are people who exploit disability benefits, who want to get paid just for existing. Do you see the paradox? The storyline of the lazy person and that of the good girl are applied to the same illnesses and the same people. During my process of getting a diagnosis, my doctors flipped all the time. One day I was lazy and wanted to be sick, the next it was my ambitions and drive which made me sick. They couldn't decide what narrative was correct because the truth was, I was just sick. These narratives, these roles we've created for the chronically ill cause prejudices to be upheld and a lack of accommodation to persevere. 
Because if I'm just a good girl who's stressed by school and the cure to stress is meditation and yoga, why would school be accommodated? This is why we need to view chronically ill people as individuals who need individual accommodation. All it took for me to get through secondary school was being allowed to replace some classes with self-study. But it also required my school to see me as a person, not as their assumption of what a chronically ill person is. My mom attended an information meeting held by our local authority. It was about how chronically ill or disabled teens could get through school and gain employment. The focus was on how we could get a basic diploma and then a, a job which requires no education and has no prospects. Well, I'm sure this was useful for some attendees, accommodation is not a one size fits all. My mom asked how I could achieve a full diploma with grades that would enable me to go to university. They looked at her puzzled and couldn't provide an answer. Because of these boxes we've created for the chronic ill where the level of activity expected is stillness, that is the only activity level which society will accommodate for. These roles are also manipulating. They've made me believe that it is my fault I am sick. I should be focusing all I have on my health and not strive for a life outside my illness. At some point, when you get told something over and over again, you start believing it to be true. When asking for access to education, I feel I am asking for too much. When asking someone to help me, I feel I am asking for too much. I am so blinded by the role society has pushed upon me that at some point, I started to believe you more than me. This has real consequences to not only the people it affects, but society as a whole. We are losing out on the potential of such a large group of people because we refuse to see them as individuals who will thrive if we offer the accommodation needed. This group of people isn't just a st statistic. It's the girl in your class who only shows up to half the lessons. It's your neighbor, your family, the friend you lost touch with. Can you imagine what life would be like without access to public transport, a car, or just being able to walk where you want, when you want to? I can't take the bus. There's a lack of seating at the stops and, well, having a seat once you've gotten on is dependent on whether someone deems you worthy of the seat they currently hold. The announcement system doesn't function and as my brain fog sometimes makes me unaware of the time past or what it looks like when I'm, where I'm supposed to get off, I end up getting off at the wrong place. Some of these issues would be better if I used my wheelchairs, but uh, that offers a whole heap of different issues. The rest of the passengers get so annoyed when the bus becomes 10 minutes delayed because of the girl who needs to ramp it out. There's a ramp up from the subway station, but in a manual wheelchair, getting up that steep hill is close to impossible. The entire system of public transport is built and planned for able-bodied people, but there is no alternative. So I'm reliant on the goodwill of other people to take me everywhere. Because of a systemic lack of accommodation, the life of a chronically ill person is often one of inertia. We stand still because society has created no other option. I have tried creating another option, one where I do the things I would if I wasn't ill. One of these things is going to amusement parks. Before I go, I needed a doctor's visit to get a badge that says I am sick enough to get a disabled skip the line badge. I can't use public transport as I explained earlier, so I'm reliant on someone taking the time to drive me and picking me up. In order to get to the entrance where there is space to put up my wheelchair, the person driving me has to argue with the parking attendant as I am not sick enough to get a disabled parking badge. Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. Once at the entrance, I have to stand in additional lines to get my skip the line badge. This counter is not always staffed and the staff there don't always know what to do. By the time I get into the park, I've already spent a day's worth of energy. I cannot go with a group of friends, only with the one carer the badge allows me. 
So not only can I not go with the group of friends I want to, as they would have to stand in line, which I can't, I also have to ask the one friend I do go with to be my carer. At every ride, I feel the same eyes on me as I get up, my, up from my wheelchair and walk the last 10 steps instead of my friend carrying me. People whisper that it's unfair or that we're cheating. The workers at every ride also have to do the same health interrogation to make sure I'm okay to go on the ride. Why can't there just be a questionnaire I fill out at the beginning? It is uncomfortable that everyone is privy to my personal health information just because I'm sick. I just wanted to go to the amusement park like any other teenager. All the extra work required for me to go is a massive deterrent. But it's like this with everything I do, except for staying in my room. If the individuals who experience this inaccessibility and prejudice of society bring these issues to the public, write debate articles, post on social media, etc., we are exposing ourselves to countless hateful and ignorant comments. You're not even sick. You're being demanding. You exploit our welfare states. You are just lazy. The response takes such a toll on our health that it often doesn't seem worth it. Engaging in political parties or pressure groups that aren't structured for chronically ill people quickly becomes too much. If we fight for our rights, we may be too sick to reap the benefits. Our own lives present enough the challenge as it is. Bringing about societal change is just too much. And when it's too much for everyone, things stay the same. This doesn't just mean institutions continue to discriminate against us. It means individuals continue to have the same image of the chronic ill. Because that image does not just result in a lack of accommodation, it results in me not wanting to go to school. Because the students there tell me I'm a drain on resources, or that I'm taking up time that could have been spent on someone who has a future. People everywhere make snide remarks that surround two main things exploitation and laziness. Now, I'm neither an exploiter nor a lazy person, but I don't have to prove that to you just to be treated as a human being. Instead of picking structural and social battles in every aspect of our lives for all foreseeable future, we continue to conform to the role of being ill. We stay at home and rest until we can pretend to be well for an hour. Going out becomes an occasion this perpetuates the image of chronically ill people as fakers. When we go out, we look well because we are pretending, but we pretend because we are all too familiar with the barriers we are met with when we present ourselves as ill. The visual image of looking sick thus becomes one dimensional. This increases the stigma associated with using AIDS, for example. When I'm in my wheelchair, people address the person pushing me, not me. They're fumbled when I stand up because in their minds, I'm paralyzed. Because of this, I leave my wheelchair at home as much as I can. People avoiding use and aids in public results in a lack of visible diversity. As a consequence, people don't take this diversity into account when making decisions of development. New elevators are being installed, but they are too small to hold electric wheelchairs. When the elevator stops working, there is no other option. What if there's a fire in a tall building? You're in a wheelchair and can't use the elevator or the stairs. Inaccessibility does not just exclude us from society. It makes us vulnerable. The role created for the chronic ill has us confined to our homes. This leads to our needs not being considered in societal development, and as a consequence, society remains inaccessible. Along with this, chronically ill people remain invisible. And with no one present to disprove prejudices, they remain untouched. I wish I could return to one of the stories I've told you today and say that it is becoming better, that things have changed. I am confident I will get the education I want, a job I will enjoy, a fulfilling life. But I don't know that. Things haven't changed. None of my stories have a happy ending yet. This is why you need to listen to my solutions and implement them. 
because I want to be able to tell these stories one day with a different ending. Things don't change by themselves. Someone needs to get the ball rolling. And that burden cannot be placed on chronically ill people alone. Society at large has to fix the issue they created. When making decisions, chronically ill people cannot be an afterthought. You can't make a plan and then adapt it to accommodate for certain people afterwards. The plan needs to be made with us. This goes for events, education, city planning, even for everyday social events. As we work to make society more accessible and accommodation more available, the role of inertia that chronically ill people have had to live by will slowly dissipate. Accommodation is not always expensive, complicated, or time consuming. For example, on a website for restaurants, schools, events, etc., include detailed information on the accessibility of your venue because it is rarely, if ever, possible for a place to be accommodated to, to every disability or chronic illness. So the information needs to be specific. Before Corona, I couldn't always participate in class and I was told that offering them online was asking for too much. Now, that is largely how education is being offered. Schools need to continue doing this even when we move back to normal. On public transport, if you see someone who needs a ramp it out, ask how you can help. If you notice it's not working or the station you're at is otherwise inaccessible, email the company in charge and tell them. If someone asks for your seat and you don't actually need it, don't ask why they do. They wouldn't ask if, you did, if they didn't need it. You giving up your seat for them does not make you privy to their personal health information. On an individual level, each and every person needs to think about their views and assumptions about chronically ill people. How do you refer to people using a wheelchair or otherwise using AIDS? Because if you, like so many people I've interacted with, talk to the person who is with us, instead of us directly, you are treating us like babies. Now, babies are cute and all, but it gets old to, talk, to have to talk to people through your mom because people refuse to refer to you directly. Despite change still seeming distant, I can see a small glimmer of hope. Corona. This pandemic has caused terrible things, but it also made me able to attend classes because suddenly they were offered online. It's become easier to work from home, go to school from home, events are from home. Getting online doctor's appointments is even easier. So, if there is one thing that makes me hopeful, it is that we have seen accommodation work. We just need it to stay this way as society goes back to normal. We have learned how to adjust to sudden change, how to include people online. All I hope is that the door stays open, even when things go back to how they were. Thank you. <laughs>